Hello and welcome everyone to Varsity Tutors, where throughout this crazy school year, our star courses will have virtual field trips, assemblies, and things like career days um, to make sure you're learning about all the things you really want to learn about. I know for most of us, a dream job would be being on TV to talk about sports. So we are thrilled to have ESPN's Jay Williams here to, uh, to tell us all about a career in sports broadcasting. Few things before we get started. I'm Brian, uh, although I have been stopped on the street to be told I look like Joe Buck while we're talking sports broadcasting, so believe it, uh, if you will. Um, and in addition to being co-host, I'm going to be Jay's on-screen producer, um, telling him some of the things that his ESPN producers would be whispering in his ear, so you get a little behind-the-scenes look at uh, how TV magic is made. Also, we know one of the most important things about sports broadcasting is the interview. And so use the chat panel to the right of our window here. Jay is going to interview you. So answer his questions there and, and we'll keep it interactive and back and forth. And then we want you to interview Jay. So at any point you have questions starting now and throughout the class, drop them in that chat there. And at the end of class, I'll interview Jay using your questions. One last thing we wanna do is make sure you get a chance to get on camera. And so have a phone or a camera nearby. And in about a half an hour, we'll have you lean into the screen, take a picture with Jay. And if you upload that photo to Instagram, tag Jay Williams, tag Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win an autographed basketball. And with that, I think that's enough of an NBA countdown to, uh, to get to the man you really wanna see here. So I'm going to get up, hand the microphone over to your teacher for today, basketball legend, ESPN personality, Jay Williams. Jay, give him your first take. Brian, I like I like those uh, those little puns that you played there as it relates to Get Up. That's the show that I'm on with Mike Greenberg. Well done there. Uh, you Thank dropped you. NBA Countdown. Also, you know, we just launched a new show called Keyshawn J. Will and Zubin, which airs every morning from 6 until 10 a.m. on ESPN2. Um, and I'm happy to be here. Hey, everybody. Jay Williams. One of the first things I started learning uh, when I got into broadcasting at the age of 23 years old was that you know, in order to be great at what you, what you do, you have to put in the work. I don't look at broadcasting as work. I look at it as my passion. It's me forcing myself to be a better version of myself each and every day. You know, you hear people like LeBron James or Kobe Bryant say these lines or Michael Jordan talking about striving for greatness. So before we start this lesson, I just want everybody to know I am excited that you are here. But now that you are here, it is time to go to work and it's time to strive for greatness. So with that being said, I'm gonna take you through our syllabus for today's class. I actually sound like a teacher, very professorial, I love it. So today's game plan, which we're gonna call the A block is the first quarter is building your brand. This is great. We'll talk about something called adaptive brand positioning is the key to survival in a rapidly changing market, which is the market of everyday life that we live, how to adapt in a crazy world. Second quarter, we'll talk about broadcasting behind the scenes. There's layers to media. You have to be comfortable with the technical aspects of it. Third quarter, which is starting to get the crunch time, which is covering and consuming news. I am going to work with you guys to dig a little bit deeper than just the face value of a headline. Uh, clickbait is also what we call it. That's an example. And then the fourth quarter, that's when things get really interesting. We'll get on camera, we'll take some selfies, and then we'll, go, we'll, we'll let this game go to overtime for the sake of it. You guys get a chance to interview me and ask me all the pertinent questions that you guys need me to answer. So Brian, that's a, that's a great breakdown of how we're gonna kick things off. Let's go to the first slide. Okay, so as a way to kick off this class, guys, I really need you guys to be interactive with me. This is not a, a one directional class where I just talk for an hour and you guys listen and take notes. I need your feedback. So the first question I have for you guys is, who is your favorite sports broadcaster? I don't care when you, you watch your first game. I don't care how you like it. I know this is a very subjective question, depending upon if you like the style, the tonality, the cadence that they use, but I need to hear some of your answers. So I'll let you guys take five seconds, five or six seconds. Tell me what you think. I always gotta stay hydrated, most important thing in TV. You know, I'm liking some of these answers here. You guys are being interactive, I like it. Okay, Charles Barkley. Interesting. All right, Jim Nance. I like it. Okay, this is good. This is really, really good, guys. All right, so we're going to go to the next slide, Brian. I'm going to show them who some of my favorite broadcasters are. Obviously, we talked about Jim Nance. I think he is one of the most iconic individuals about breaking down games, and his cadence never change. If you see the headline of this, it's called Building Your Brand. So think about how you know some of these individuals. Tony Romo and I are really good friends. Predictive analysis. 
He tells you what's going to happen before it actually happens. He is a Twitter dream. Okay, I see the interactivity is so high with him. You have Jalen Rose and Ben Simmons. I work with Jalen Rose on NBA Countdown. He knows the culture better than anybody else and can break things down in very simple terms. Bill Simmons, he not only was a broadcaster, but he also created The Ringer, okay? A multi-million dollar company. And my friend JJ Reddick, who played basketball at Duke, also has a podcast on his company. Uh, at the bottom left, you have Ernie Johnson, one of the best in the game. Uh, you see him on TV each and every day, just very himself, uh, very natural in how he delivers news. Charles Barkley, he's a big brother to me. CB is uh, a guy who tells you things very raw and unfiltered. And then you have SVP. I got to tell you guys, uh, getting a chance to watch Late Night Sports Center with SVP is one of the best gifts a person can ever ask for. He is truly a fan of the game. And even the bad beat section of the, the, the show that he does is so incredible because that's, that's really him. He pays attention to the spreads all the time. He tells you what he likes to see. And the beautiful thing about all these individuals, guys, is that they are true to who they are, right? Obviously, they worked on their craft. Obviously, they perfect their craft. But when you watch them on TV, when you watch them or listen to them on a podcast, you feel like you're at a bar right next to them watching the game. They're not talking to you. They're talking with you. They're having a conversation with you. You may disagree, but their cadence and how they deliver content, how they actually articulate what their POV is, that means perspective, is everything. That can get you leaning on the edge of your seat. Right, Either you want to debate with them or you agree with them. And, and that's the type of content that as a TV producer, like Brian will tell you, you want that kind of riveting conversation. You want your fans or you want the people that are consuming what you're saying to engage with you, to interact with you, to be one with you. You can never do a show alone. You are the most important aspect of the show. So that's the first lesson, okay? We're always trying to get you to be involved. So start paying attention to the people, not only for their cadence, the tonality in which they say, but how they're getting you to be involved in the show. How are they getting you to interact? Do you feel like they're actually talking to you? So with that being said, let's go to the next slide. We're gonna talk about you know, how we actually, what are some differentiators in how you build a brand? So I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about myself because I think this is really important. We talked about adaptive, brand positioning. I call it ABP. A lot of you guys are asking me, Jay, what the heck is ABP? So for me, I got hurt in a horrific motorcycle accident. I went through serious depression for a pretty long time. And after I came out of depression, I had an attempt at suicide, my second attempt. I'm going to be very real with you guys, being very authentic and transparent. And after my attempt was unsuccessful, I, I had a conversation with my father because I used to be in this perpetual habit of always saying, why me? Why me? Why was it me that had to get into an accident? Why did I have to jeopardize my career? A lot of why in a negative connotation. And I said it to my dad and my dad said, you know, son, I will flip that question on his back. And I will say to you, why not you? Maybe your shoulders were built to carry this weight. And maybe you should start looking at your life about what you have and about what you've been given instead of what's been taken away from you. And it was at that moment, it was the first time in my life that I learned how to pivot. I learned how to, instead of allowing other people, like we see happen in news all the time, tell the story for me. I started to think about how I wanted to tell my own story and how I wanted to use my own journey to help other people. And in the process of helping other people, I was going to help myself, right? So that was my first step in the brand building of who Jay Williams was. Because people would say, well, were you the guy that shot your chauffeur? Were you the guy that had white, white boy tattooed on your knuckles? There's all this conflation in the market, confusion in the market about who I was. And I started putting pen to paper. I started writing my own story. And then once I released my own story, I found out that other people in life have gone through pain too. And I said, wow, you know, if you've torn an ACL. Maybe that's the worst pain you've ever gone through. But for me, that was my way to connect with you. That was a bridge. I was building a bridge. I was filling in the gaps, right? Other people have had worse experiences, building connection points. And I think by doing that, I learned how to connect the people. So I think what I just talked about right there, guys, is owning your own story. 
I think that is one of the biggest parts of differentiating yourself. You have to be transparent with who you are. And the more you own your story, the more honest you are about your growth and how you're learning. I think that allows other people to embrace you because then they know that you're not talking to them like you're better than them. You're talking with them. You're not talking to them. You're talking with them. So one of the next aspects of this, and I'll be really quick because Brian's already in my ear. I see, I hear him talking, you know, on to the next slide is I, I call it CRM. Okay. It, it's called customer relationship management. Now I know this is a business acronym that people will not be familiar with, but CRM is so important. So to any of my students who are currently in college or if you're in high school, this is imperative. You need to listen to me. Whether you're a student athlete or whether you're just somebody who is trying to come up, you want to be a broadcaster, okay? How are you connecting the dots? Have you sat down with your guidance counselor? Have you asked her, who are the biggest alumni who have graduated from my school? And then once you are relentless in your pursuit to find out who these people are, maybe to get their emails, how are you proactively connecting with them? How are you reaching out to them? Are you sending them an email? Are you trying to connect with them via DM on Instagram? Are you connecting with them on Twitter? And then I don't want to see, because I look at my DMs every single day. I don't want to say, hey, Jay, just trying to connect with you. Thanks for reaching out. I don't want to see that. You have to tell me your why. There's a book by Simon Sinek that says the power of why. Why are you different? Why do I want to take time out of my day when I have to spend time with my wife? I have to spend time with my daughter who's about to turn two years old. I would spend time with my mother who is immune suppressed and has gone through two kidney transplants. Why am I taking or allocating time out of my day to connect with you? You have to start telling me your story. I work with a, a young lady, her name is Christina, and we work on her resume. And she handed me her resume. And it was, a, it was a bullet list of all these different things that she's accomplished. And I said, okay, these are great. These are things that you've accomplished, but I don't know who you are. I don't know what your why is. You have to tell me your why. So once you're able to establish your why, you connect with people, you build out what that database is of people that are buying into who you are that want to help you. And then what you do is you use those connections to continue to build up trip. this uh, 30 seconds. I got it, Brian, this infrastructure of who you are. And this allows you to start networking and climbing and asking for favors, but also knowing that you need to do things in return for them. But you're building out your CRM. And I think it's very, very important. Okay, that's enough with CRMing, customer relationship management. Our next slide is something that I got a little bit frustrated at Brian for putting together because he had to remind me of why I was the second pick in the draft and not the first pick. And this is the reason. How can you stand out? Yao Ming is 7'6". He naturally stands out. But my question to a lot of you guys, how do you stand out? What are going to be your differentiators? I talked about, for me, being authentic, being transparent, connecting the dots, owning my own story, telling my story, embracing other people's story, you know, spinning things on their axis. When people, you know, combat me with negativity, I spin it quickly into positivity. And then I get them to buy into what my energy is all about. And then I've just made a friend. I haven't made an enemy, I've made a friend. So how do you stand out? What are different ways that you could stand out? Brian, next slide after that. It's very important. I think it's something that everybody needs to ask themselves as we think about what are ways that you could stand out. Before we do that, Jay, CRM opportunity. These kids okay. weren't born when there were three Jason Williamses in the NBA. You want to tell them real quick about the Nets and the Kings? You're right, Brian. I should probably tell them about, um, you know, Jason. So Jason Williams, I have to give you guys context because I am old now. I've officially become old, even though in my mind, I feel very young. So Jason Williams, who played for the Nets, was um, a, a big time basketball player, but he had shot his chauffeur on accident. It turned into a really big story. It was really bad. He also had some other incidents that occurred and we were both from New Jersey. And being that we were, there was a lot of confusion when things would happen. People wouldn't know if they were referencing the Jason Williams from the Nets that shot his chauffeur or got a DUI or played for the Nets for 10 plus years or if they're referencing the Jason Williams from Duke. The other Jason Williams, AKA White Chocolate, was one of the, he might be the baddest Jason Williams of them all. That's why I changed my name to Jay. Um, played for the Sacramento Kings, maybe one of the most gifted pastors we've ever seen. So whenever somebody would say Jason Williams, it was like, well, who are you referencing? The one from the Nets, the one from the Kings, or the ones from the guy from Duke or the Bulls? So that's the context behind Jason Williams. Thank you for that, Brian. I appreciate that. So I, I leave the next onto the B block. Off. Yes, onto the B block. 
I lead the next segment off with what is the hardest thing about TV broadcasting? I want you guys to tell me what some of the hardest things you think there are about broadcasting. I'll take another swig of my water as we interact with each other. Okay, I'm liking some of these answers. Remembering players' names and their stats, that's a good one. That is somewhat challenging. A fear of public speaking, that's another one. I, I have some tricks for that one as well. Also, okay, that was another really good one. Having opinions or insights on games you didn't watch. All right, so with all of those being said, and those are all great questions, guys. We're gonna start breaking this down with some some techniques and practices. And, and Brian, leave this up here for just one second. Because, you know, techniques and practice, it always brings me back to that great line that Alan Iverson said, where, you know, we're talking about practice. Yes, we're talking about practice. Practice is something that you can do every single day. I don't know if you guys are listening to me right now. You cannot see me, but listen to the tempo of my voice and how I am talking. One of the first lessons I ever learned was I had to slow myself down to make sure that I was enunciating every word. Brian, put me back on the screen. I think that is so important. How you tell a story and the cadence in which you deliver content is everything. I had a tendency of speaking very, very fast when I first came on. I was so excited. I wanted to tell you the story and I wanted to tell you every context of it. And I want to give you all the details of it. And when I started talking really fast, I didn't enunciate my words. I didn't slow down to change up the style. You hear this and it's very applicable in basketball. I don't wanna play the game at hundred miles per hour all the time. You see LeBron James when he plays, right? He slows it down. He changes it up. Oh, it goes to 50 miles per hour. He comes back down to 20 miles per hour. He goes to 70 miles an hour. It comes back down to 10. Changing tempo keeps you engaged. Now all of a sudden you don't know which direction I'm going to go and when I'm going to go there. So. Also, another technique that I've learned how to do is, you know, you, you see this all the time with improv. I would tell everybody, take an improv class, okay? I, one of the people that I got a chance to spend time around, she is incredible. What she does is, her name is Carissa Thompson. And in our relationship, we always talk because she would ask me a question, okay? So if I were to ask you a question, if I were to say, tell me why Michael Jordan is the best player on the planet, okay? So what just happened there? Tell me why Michael Jordan is the best player on the planet. One, two, three, four. If you took four seconds to answer that question, think about that. Here's a four second pause in TV. How awkward is that? How awkward is that, right? So the way it's called tie-ins or transitions. One of the things that you can do in everyday conversation with people, you tie in the last word or the last couple of words of their sentence, and you use that as a pause to give yourself time to think about where you wanna go with your next sentence. What you do not do is you don't insert words like um or hum, those are crux words, right? You're only doing that to buy time. And people get that. Think about if you're on TV, um, or like. You don't say like on TV. You don't say um or hum. What you do is, let me tell you why Michael Jordan is the best player on the planet. So while I'm repeating your own sentence, I am giving myself time to think to either agree with you or disagree. Something else that I say, all right? Quick twitch fibers. You need this in this game. You have to be quick. You have to be quick all the time. Quick and slow. Play fast, think slow. It's something you hear in basketball, but it's very applicable to TV. So when I say black, I, it's opposite game, okay? Play with me. When I say black, what do you say? When I say car, what do you say? Good. These are all great lessons, right? So now it, you have to find ways if you disagree, take that opposite word, transition it, and now tell me why you disagree. And give me analogies that are applicable to your life. Prime example, the other day I was on TV and we were talking about everything happening with the Milwaukee Bucks, right? And we were talking about the fact that I'm not sure the Milwaukee Bucks are going to win. And this is, might be inside baseball for you guys because they don't, I'm not sure if their second player, Chris Middleton, is, an, is a star in the NBA. And I said, here's an analogy for you, okay? Here's an analogy. In order for my marriage to be successful, I need my wife to be a star. My wife needs me to be a star. We both have high expectations. 
where we need to bring a subset of skills to the table and we need to work on it every single day to make sure that we are winning. We want to win championships in our marriage, right? So when I tell you that analogy, obviously you're like, wow, gave a whole different meaning to Chris Middleton. I need Chris Middleton to raise the expectations of how he plays so he can be on the same page as Giannis so they can win a world championship. Analogies are important. Also, the one last trick I will do, because Brian's already counting me out. I, I feel it. He doesn't even need to interrupt me and say it, is I would play this game in New York City all the time. How do you have conversations with people, random people? Now, you can start with your parents. That's easy, okay? If you're starting with your parents, do an interview with your parents. I guarantee you, everybody that is paying attention on this Zoom call right now, with Varsity Tutors, that's a plug. That's naturally, that happens sometimes in TV. You can give a little plug. People may not pay attention to it, but you do it subconsciously, drop that nugget in their head, is interview your parents. You spend all the time in the world with your parents and I guarantee you, you are doing such a disservice to your relationship because you don't know things about your parents. You don't know why they raised you the way they raised you. You don't know why they have certain habits. Think about what are some very personal intricate questions you can ask your parents. And then while you're asking them, pay attention to their tone. If you see their voice, if you see their tonality raise, oh, was that a pressure point? Did that bring you back to a certain place? I got a chance to ask my dad some questions before about our past. And when I asked my dad some questions, I found out this really interesting habit, okay? When I asked him questions that were somewhat challenging questions, he started like this on the table. So paying attention to mannerisms was important because now there's something there. I'm seeing that you're slightly getting uncomfortable and now it's my journalistic responsibility to start to probe a little bit more around why your body language is getting uncomfortable. And those are the keys to a really good interview. You have to probe, it's like being a point guard. I don't want to score right away. I can use an escape dribble. I can take my time and dribble the clock out and pay attention to the floor and let the defense reveal itself to me. So this game that I played also in New York, find yourself, even if it's for three minutes, challenge yourself with a stranger or with a friend, play this game with your friends. Have your friends give you a random topic. So my friends would do it in New York City all the time. Hey Jay, this topic is whales. Okay, I had to go over and talk to another guy for three minutes about whales. and say, hey, well, what do you think about this team? What do you think about that team? What kind of whales do you like? Do you like big whales? Do you like small whales? I don't know, I'm not a whale guy. You seem like a whale guy. Now, the conversation may be awkward and the person may have no idea what the heck you're talking about, but who cares about that? That's not your challenge. The challenge is how do you engage that person? Are you making them laugh? Are you making them think? Are you actually having a person respond to you about, I don't know what kind of whales I like. Maybe I should think about what kind of whales I like. Are you finding ways to make the conversation easy? I think all these are things that you learn when you engage yourself and you make yourself uncomfortable. When you are uncomfortable, you are growing, guys. And there's not one day on TV that I'm not uncomfortable, but I own it when I'm on air. And when I mess up, when I engage in conversation, maybe I ask a dumb question, I own it. I self-deprecate. That was a dumb question. Can't believe that, I asked Jeff? that one. But now that I asked it, great. You know what I've done? I've just helped your wall fall down. Now all of a sudden by me making fun of myself, what does that give you the power to do? Make fun of yourself. And now all of a sudden we're engaging in a different layer, a different stratosphere because it's personable. We're owning our stories together. Okay, next slide. That was enough on that one. Techniques, next. Sorry, Brian, go ahead and interrupt me. You got it? Jay, why you, why you have that notebook out? Let's talk about preparation. All right, let's talk about preparation. We talked about technique practice. We talked about authenticity, transparency, fairness. I think one of the things, guys, that is so important is as it relates to authenticity and transparent, I said before, you have to be who you are on air. People are so good at sniffing out BS. If you're trying to fake something, people will call you. So one of the things I do, here's my notebook, okay? I mean, I have pages for days of notes here on everything that's happening. So some of my notes that I'm talking about are different wide receiver tiers. You know, I got labeled as a basketball guy. I think it's the first question that people ask you all the time. Think about this. When you meet somebody, they say, hey, I'm Jay Williams. Nice to meet you. Oh, Jay, what do you do? Well, first off, I'm not what I do. I'm way more. 
And people like to put you in a box to try to define you, to try to understand you. And it's a very simplistic way of thinking because just because I do something doesn't mean I am what I do. So I have to work extra hard to be able to talk about football, to be able to talk about baseball, to be able to talk about UFC fights, to be able to talk about all sports any given time of the day. So preparation is imperative, guys, because you have to be prepared. And I think once you're able to be prepared, then I think everything else takes care of itself. One of the other things we talked about here, and I'm looking down my notepad because I'm going over my, my notes here, is insight and analysis, like doing your homework. You have to love what you do, guys. You have to love it. I am talking to you right now, and I'm also watching NFL Live. I'm watching it at the same time. It's multitasking. I have an IFB here in my hand, okay? So this goes in my ear right here. And this is something that Brian, that you were hearing the conversation that we're having. I would be having this conversation with Brian. He would be guiding me, telling me what camera to look into. Camera one, camera two, camera three. Oh, the jib camera's going over the top. Wow, and I can't miss a beat about what my actual point is. I can't lose my track of thought about talking about being prepared. So yes, I may have 10 pages of notes and I may not reference my notes once because now I've done my homework and I'm prepared. I can go back and reference it seconds until C -block. once I have to do this, okay? But I may just call it out, but I'm gonna go back to my notepad because I need to reference something or where's that one stat that I thought I had? But I have my notes just in case I need my notes. I don't need them to be on air to deliver my content because I'm constantly studying this. This is who I am, this is what I do. Okay, All right. good enough stuff, next slide. Okay. So this is a great situation. Brian, leave this up for one second because this is the question I have to you guys. Tell me how you guys would react if you saw breaking news this morning on ESPN that with game seven of a conference finals tomorrow night, a star player, whoever that name is, left the Orlando bubble yesterday citing only personal reasons and reportedly is not scheduled to return until just prior to game time. What would you think? Give me some of your, give me some of your feedback there. All right, interesting. Some people, family issue that happened with Zion Williamson. We think it happened with Zion Williamson. Um, okay, and fascinating. Maybe something went wrong. Maybe there's a problem we don't know about. Yes, okay, great. This is so important, guys. This is, um, this is a problem I have a little bit with media, okay? And this is the C block. This is our third quarter covering and consuming news. Hot takes are easy. Journalism takes work. We just spoke about that, how to be prepared. And every story has context. Please, please, I beg of you, do not be a person that reads a headline and then just reacts, knee-jerk reaction on social media to the headline. Do some research, find some other articles, get some context, do some digging. So what we just made mention of, it's clickbait. It happens all the time. I've had this happen to me. I had a situation where I was on air with Mike Greenberg, we were doing Get Up, and this was at the beginning of the pandemic, okay? And Mike asked me a hypothetical question. He said, Jay, if we get back to a place in which we're allowed to have sports, which means we put procedures in place, protocols in place, we're finding a cure. It's safe to play sports. Would you like to see athletes play? And I said, 1,000%, Mike. Let me tell you about some of the situations. My next door neighbor just had to have a child during COVID, and it was a horrible experience for her. People have lost friends and loved ones. And you think about what sports do. Sports takes you away from all the troubles you have in your life, and it builds camaraderie within society. And when I ask all the athletes that are having an opportunity to play, I know there's a major sacrifice that comes along with that. But think about what that provides to other people. So I say this, right? Now you have context to this whole conversation. But then when I wake up the next morning, I'm getting notes from people on my PR team saying, damage control, damage control, we need you to explain yourself. And I go back and I see that my own network has actually put out a clip of Jay Williams says players need to play. And it doesn't give context to the question 
in the scenario in which Mike Greenberg had proposed. It only gives my answer. So now my answer is actually answering the question that you see as a headline. Jay Williams says players need to play, right? So now all of a sudden, I'm trying to explain myself all the time. So it was a great valuable lesson for me. What I started doing then is I started repeating the question in my answer. So now there's no confusion. There's no conflation about that. But what I would challenge everybody to do, we live in a world that gets politicized all the time. And it's in sports, guys. It's in sports. It's happening. So instead of just reacting and just typing in 100 plus characters on Twitter or Instagram, take 10 minutes to read some other articles that give you context about, well, I wonder what context this question was asked. I wonder what this player has been through that maybe, maybe ask them about that. And while you do that, guys, you're building a great habit. It's called doing due diligence, right? Actually doing some diligence about something before you just speak. I'll give you another example, because Brian's already given me the quick eye, is when the whole George Floyd thing happened, and I'm not politicizing what we're talking about right now, everybody was quick to say, Jay, you need to be on camera. You need to talk about this. You need to talk about this. Your voice is important. You're an African-American guy. You live in this world. You need to talk about it. I actually boycotted it for four to five days. I said, I'm not just going back on air, guys. I owe it to the people I'm talking to and to myself to actually come to the table with a plan, with tangible actions. Yes, this has happened to me before. I've been stereotyped, it's happened. But I'm not gonna sit up on national TV and just yell again. I wanna give actionable items that people can then take away from our conversation and then they can follow through on those things instead of just being somebody that gets up on TV and yells, right? So it leads me to a great point. Being practical and reasonable is something that we're missing in today's media culture. People are giving spins on the facts. They're not giving you the facts. So now it's your job. It's an added responsibility that you owe to society to do due diligence, to learn more about what the facts are. Find out the facts. And then once you have an opinion, once you label the facts, I'm okay with it. Don't come out and just spin the facts for the sake of rating. We know about that. I think that's a very, very valuable lesson. Brian, next on the slide. All right, time to summarize. So guys, here, here are a couple of things that we've learned from today in the time that we've been able to spend. I've been talking to you guys already for 32 minutes. You know, what's your differentiator? How are you finding ways to be different? What is your why? How are you owning your story? How are you connecting your story to other individuals? How are you building out your board. What I mean by your board, every company has a board. Who's on your board? Who are you getting to buy into where you want to be? And how are you having a relentless pursuit to do that? Practicing your technique, working, working each and every day. See, I was rushing. I said working, not working. Enunciating your words, taking your time, working on your pace, working on your tempo, working on the intonations of your voice to get people excited or to bring people back down. How are you keeping them engaged? Finding your authentic voice is so important. Speak to things that you know. Speak to things that are true to you. When you do that, you naturally will be passionate. You naturally will be engaged. And as a viewer, I will feel that. I will sense that through the television or through the you know, telephone or whatever device I'm working on. And then the last, be thorough and be proactive and seek context. Guys, that is so important. That is the most important thing. Tell me context, provide context. Tell me why you think this person is thinking this way. Dig deeper into who you are talking about or what you are talking about. Come to the table with knowledge. Don't just be one of these people that thrives to be on air because you like the talk. A lot of people like the talk. Talk with purpose. Do something with intent. I said to you at the beginning of this whole thing, this is not a game. This is hard to do. People think it's hard to be a professional athlete. It's even harder to be a broadcaster, okay? I, I call games with 26 individuals that are all made it to the 1% of the world. And you know when I look to my left and you know when I look to my right, I see Maria Taylor and I see Jalen Rose. That's it. When I'm on my morning show, I think about who are other big time people that have morning shows. I can barely count them. It's hard. 
It's a grind. I wake up every day at 3 a.m. in the morning. I research all the time. And I want to work on being better. I said it today because obviously there's a lot happening in our country today. And I say I wake up and I live my life by this hashtag. It's be better. We just had Kobe Bryant's birthday a couple of days ago. And Kobe was a dear friend of me. And I will say this. Was he a flawed individual? Yes. We are all human beings. We're all flawed. But you know the one thing I love about Kobe? He kept going. He kept coming. John Wooden told me this great story. He said, Jay, there are two types of people in life. I have, their, I have the award right behind me. There it is. Right there in the right-hand corner. He said, there are two types of people in life. The first person runs into the wall, falls down, has a bloody nose, knocked out a couple of their teeth, and they're crying. They said, the wall, I hit the wall. I, I can't. It hurts so bad. The second person runs into the wall, gets a bloody nose, knocks out some teeth, gets up, runs back into the wall, falls down, nose is worse, teeth are worse, gets up, and has this cycle of keep pounding through the wall until inevitably he crashes through the wall. And he looks over his shoulder and he looks at the rumblings behind him and he says, I knew that wall never defined me. Be that person that regardless of whatever you go through, don't let those experiences define you. Let them empower you. Let them make you better. That's context on who I am. I want you to provide me context with who you are and you have to tell me your why. That is so important. Brian? All right. Well, I, I am ready to run through a wall right now, but that would take me off camera. So let's, uh, I'll, I'll do it in about 15 minutes. Um, huge. Thanks, Jay. This was, I think one of my favorite, we have a ton of amazing questions. We'll get to in a second. One of my favorites, somebody even said, I don't have a question, but you're just super inspirational. Um, they didn't specify. They might've met me. I think they met you, Jay. So um, thanks for inspiring everyone here. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Now it's the fourth quarter. So um, let's, uh, let's get everybody on camera, maybe with some self, well, definitely with some selfies. We got your prize there and maybe you can get some uh get some all american trophies up. and things um so everybody, if you've there. got those cameras ready let's lean into the screen and uh we'll get some pictures with jay on the way out we'll put up the instructions for how to win that ball i got the naismith right here you guys can see it there we go how do you feel about that it's really nice and shiny it's my baby this one this is this is the one and then but this is the real one i have to be careful with it I'll show you guys that I referenced it, but this was one of the best awards that I ever won. This is the uh, John R. Wooden Award, which is so cool. It's like the Heisman for football, guys. It's awesome. All right, there you go. Don't drop it, Jay. Don't drop it. Be better. Ah, there you go. Okay. What else can I show them? Show them this. This is cover of ESPN Magazine, which is really cool with Kevin Durant and Rich Kleiman. That was one of my relationships that I made with Rich, meeting him back in the day. We formed the boardroom, which we sold to ESPN. We actually owned the intellectual property, which I thought was pretty cool. And the last one I have for you guys was, they told me I was gonna be on the cover of Sports Illustrated. You can only imagine how excited I got. That I was gonna be in my Duke black uniform. That I was gonna be having a good time, you know, look really tough. And they're like, no, I'm gonna put you in a Duke varsity jacket with a Clark Kent hat in a suitcase. I don't even know if they make suitcases like that. I don't even know what kind of, it's a tweed belt. Would, I, I would never wear a tweed belt. Not that I'm knocking anybody that wears tweed belts. It's okay. And khakis. But I was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. So it's pretty cool. And that's not one of those. They sell those online. You can like put a picture of you and they'll put it in. That's a real cover of Sports Illustrated. So Super. awesome. Hopefully everybody got a, a good picture with Jay throughout when he's answering your questions. Uh, oh, that's a pretty good one. Let me flip right back that's over to you, okay. Jay. Paul, Matt. I got it. Awesome. I'm losing the palm. That's why I quit. I got small hands, Brian. <laughs> exactly. You can only Point guard hands. So they, uh, yeah. Perfect. All right. Now, time to interview Jay. You guys have been asking some amazing questions. Um, we'll, uh, we'll put Jay on the hot seat here for a little bit. Usually he's the interviewer. Now, uh, now he's the interviewee. A um, couple for you uh, off the bat. A lot of questions from people asking you know, basically how they become broadcasters. And you've talked a lot about that. Uh, one is what classes should someone be taking in high school or majors in college if they want to become a broadcaster? Well, communications is always something good that you can take. Um, but also, I, 
you know, I, I, I'm not going to say that education is not important because education is imperative to enlightening your mind. But Brian, the advice I would give to people is that, you know, while you're in college, how, like, what are you doing to get your foot in the door in the broadcasting world? Are you willing to be an intern? Will you go to the local school radio and just say, hey, look, you know, I, one of the things I had here, I have it over here. I have a rundown and we have interns all the time that figure out what our rundowns are. Right? Like, well, Jay, what do you want to talk about here in the A block? What do you want to talk about in the C block? So are, are you finding a way to get in where you fit in? Do anything it takes, right? Like, hey, hey, broadcaster, I'll bring you a coffee every morning. I just want a shot, right? So how you find a way to get your foot in the door, I think is always important. Your education will only do so far. You have to hustle for this, guys. You have to network. You have to find people that can help elevate you. Uh, one of my cousins, her name is Bailey Williams, you know, goes to school down in Florida, and she did that for a year. She just got people stuff and all of a sudden she was in broadcasting school. She built connections. She formed a great relationship with Maria Taylor on her own. You know, a lot of people say, how can you just connect her? Cause I wanted to see if she can do it. And next thing I know, like she's getting job offers. You have to find a way to connect and find a way to get your foot in the door. That's so imperative and do whatever it takes as long as you're not compromising your values and your morals, but do whatever it takes to get to show up early, stay late, do what it takes. And then all you can ask for is that one shot. And if you let the person know your intent, hey, I want to do this, and they see the passion that is driving you each and every day, then that will speak for itself. And ultimately, you will get your chance. The question I will have for you is, are you ready when you get your chance? Jeremy Lin, who played for the Knicks, who signed a multi-million dollar deal, is an example. Tom Brady is an example. When Drew Bledsoe goes down, if Tom Brady wasn't ready, Tom Brady never becomes the greatest quarterback to ever live. You have to be ready. And that starts with how prepared you are. And that starts now. Perfect. Great advice. Um, yeah, it's not. Sports broadcasting isn't the job you find on Craigslist and apply for. There's no, uh, I don't know if there's a monster.com anymore. There's no indeed.com job description for Jay Williams. Um, you know, you have to, to hustle and, and find your opportunity, which leads me to Morgan at Winthrop University asked, how do I get an internship at ESPN? Wow. Um, I would start by calling whoever's on your local ESPN network, right? And I would start calling them every day. Every day. Hunt people down. Find out who people are. There's this thing on the internet called LinkedIn. And if you go on LinkedIn, you can find out who works at your local channel. Find out their name. Read their profile. Start sending them emails. Start calling into the show. Start calling the office. Start reading about sports in your local town. Reach out to people, connect with people, but you have to be relentless in your pursuit. So a lot of people always ask me, well, how do I get an intern at ESPN? I'm like, well, ESPN is really difficult, right? It's in Bristol, Connecticut. Are you willing to move to Bristol, Connecticut? I don't know. Maybe you just want to show up to Bristol, Connecticut. You ever think about that? Maybe just buy Maybe take a car, ride there and show up to Bristol, Connecticut or find out who your local ESPN channel is and show up to the network there. Show up to your local channel, knock on the door, write letters, send emails. You have to be relentless, but you also have to tell people, like I told you about the girl that I'm working with, her name is Christina. You have to tell me about your why, what, make, what makes you different? What makes me want to give you a shot? And I'm not gonna give people a shot who just say, well, I tried, there goes that. You know, I, I sent one email, I sent one direct message, it didn't work out. And look, man, th this, is, this is a tough field. You have, to, you have to have thick skin to be in this field. You don't think people who disagree with me like to use my accident and try to throw it against me. Oh, Jay hit his head too hard on that motorcycle accident. You think I'm gonna let that stop me? I engage with those people. So people say no, what they really mean is yes. So you have to hear yes in your mind. So when they say no, keep working harder. Make them understand why no is not enough. Awesome. Good advice. And uh, man, we are all ready to run through that wall right now, Jay. That, uh, that energy come through the screen. All right. Another uh, big theme that a lot of people had was, um, you know, who inspired you to be a broadcaster? What broadcasters did you most look up to growing up? How did they influence your career? Um, tell us about, you know, some of the broadcasters. I guess another one is which broadcasters, when you were a player, were you excited to hear them saying your name? Um, tell us about some of the broadcasters you've admired and how they led you to where you are. Never grew up paying attention to broadcasters, guys. 
be very frank with you, never paid attention to the nuances of how things were done. It wasn't until I had my first job and I got very lucky how I got my foot in the door, those two awards behind me. Like I, I also been very transparent about, you know, for the first couple of years, I shouldn't have had a job. A guy named Dan Steer uh, took a chance on me and Dan Steer, I know that extension because it called me every day, was the guy that I referenced that taught me to talk like this with that pace in that tempo because I spoke too fast every day. And then once I started to learn the craft of broadcasting, I paid attention to the likes of Jim Nance, Bob Costas, how they never really changed the inflection of their voice. It was always the same and they delivered it exactly the way it needed to be delivered every time. Then I started working with a guy named Mike Greenberg, who was incredible because I wanted to be a host. How do you transition in and out of different blocks? How do you throw to an interview? How do you take an interview with somebody and then go to uh, talking over B-roll, which is sometimes, you know, what you see in B-roll is when, if you're paying attention to my screen, if you were to see highlights of me playing on the screen while I'm talking over that, that is talking over B-roll, sound over tape, right? It's things that SOT, SOT, you hear all these different terminologies that are used throughout the midst of a broadcast because that's the way we communicate to each other. So spending time with producers going into the truck. I don't know if people have ever even paid attention to that. If you're a producer, if you have a chance to go to a local radio show or a local TV network, and you, if you get so lucky to get your foot in the door as an intern, spend time in the truck. Spend time with your producer, your senior uh, producer or your coordinating producer. Understand how things work. You'll, your mind will be blown at how many camera angles there are, even at a local television network, and how many people are putting in the hard hours behind the scenes to make sure that you look and sound great, but you learn the technical aspects of how things need to be positioned in order for you to be good. And you learn the importance about actually to pay attention to your producer who gives you account how imperative it is. If Brian says, Jay, 30 seconds, and I go, our show is an hour. Brian says, Jay, you got 30 seconds. Say I go for a minute. You know what that does? That messes up the entire show. Now we have to condense. We still have commercial breaks. So when you see a show that goes for 30 minutes, that means it's really 16 minutes of real TV. Now you might have seven of those minutes or six of those minutes might be pre-packaged elements, right? So think about it. We went from you know 17 minutes to now 11 minutes of content. Now say you're sharing 11 minutes with three other people. So if you go over, now all of a sudden you have to condense the show. You may not get that next segment in that might be the big segment that you want. You may have to take less time on that or you may not be able to expound yourself because now you have to give that other 30 seconds to the other broadcaster that you're on set with because he didn't get a chance to talk the last block because you were too busy hogging the ball, making it all about you instead of being a team player and making it all about the team. So these things are very important. I learned all these different things by paying attention to the people I work with. So it's not one person in particular, it's everybody I work with because I learned something from everybody. Great. I love that. I think that insight's really good too, that, you know, you mentioned that, you know, there may be 26 players in a game, but you know, only three studio hosts and a play-by-play -play and all, but there are other jobs in the truck, right? There's producing jobs. So anyone who wants to be involved in sports broadcasting, um, you know, other internships, other, you know, there are other ways to get involved that, uh, that could lead you on air or, uh, you know, at least get you in the neighborhood of, uh, of, of being able to be, you know, part of sports TV, which is really cool. And Brian, the producers are great because they're, they're super smart. So when you say, Hey, LeBron James, had 30 points last night and 10 assists. And then my producer comes to me and says, well, did you hear what the quote LeBron said today? He said, only half my brain is focused on the game because the other half of my brain is focused on equality for people and everything that's just happened in the last couple of days. So think about that. Wow, my producer just gave me insight. If LeBron James is only using half his brain to drop 30 and 18. Imagine when he uses 100% of his brain. Right, but that gives me a narrative to provide you context on what LeBron James is going through. And now that allows me to better storytell about my point on why LeBron James is so special. 
That's, I want to get into now actually a lot of questions coming in. So we got a couple minutes left uh, before we wrap here, Jay. Um, and I'll be quicker with my answers, Brian. You're right. Excellent. You're, you're doing well. I, I, need to, I need to step up as the producer. Um, one, a lot of people are asking about will their favorite team win the title? Um, so rather than go through line by line and just list every team that's, uh, that's still involved, um, what storylines are you most, you know, as, as a broadcaster, kind of analyzing what's going to happen in the second round, you know, what's going to happen the rest of the way? What storylines are you most excited about following the rest of the playoffs? Uh, well, number one is if LeBron James could win his, you know, fourth championship, that would put him in a completely different stratosphere and what it would do ultimately for his legacy. Number two is Kawhi Leonard um, leaves the Toronto Raptors after spending one year there winning a championship, being a finals MVP, then leaves, goes to the Clippers who are having some issues with the Mavericks they play tonight. But Toronto is a team a lot of people don't know about, and they have one of the best records in the Eastern Conference, and Nick Nurse is their coach. He's the coach of the year. They're one of the most underrated teams in basketball. So I, I think that story is tremendous if they're able to pull that off. Um, and also, you know, I, the Clippers are a big one. Obviously, Kawhi and Paul George, what's happening. Luka Doncic is one of the best stories we've seen in the game. I don't think, Brian, I've ever seen a player, with the exception of maybe a handful of a couple, Kobe Bryant, not Kobe, Michael, Shaquille O'Neal, maybe Dwayne Wade. How many players can you guys name that after only in their second year, we're now talking about them being – a top five or top 10 player in the league. That's what we're talking about with Luka Doncic. I don't need to hear Luka Doncic's name mentioned anymore with Trey Young or Zion Williamson or Ja Morant. They're all very special players. But Luka Doncic is piercing the conversation about being top five in the NBA. That's with Kevin Durant, Stephen Curry, LeBron James, Giannis, Kawhi, James Harden. Like he's in that conversation right there. We're not having that about Trey Young. We're not having that about Ja Morant or Zion Williamson. So that's the last one is probably the biggest because my mind has been blown at how talented he is. That well, and, and a lot of lot of storylines. That's uh, you know Kawhi and uh, and Luca in the same series, and you know a lot of exciting things to watch. We um, your next class, we do a little bit of a plug. Your next class coming up in about a month. We'll uh, we'll break down a lot more basketball. And we'll be closer to the mm -hmm. finals. So uh, for people who want to talk hoop. We, uh, we've got that coming up. I think maybe the last one is, though, you sort of alluded to, you know, that uh, sometimes as a broadcaster, you're, you're thrust into not just basketball news, but national news, kind of life and death type news and everything. And you're pretty noteworthy for, you know, being, you know, as your early shift on, on ESPN, a lot of times you're one of the ones that has to kind of, you know, be called on for breaking news. Your social media, you know, you're often, um, you know, pretty outspoken about, um, you know, current events and those kind of things. And so you've got a you know, reputation as using your platform to, uh, to draw attention to, to issues of importance. Um, for kids here, do you have any advice for, uh, you know, anyone, everyone's got a platform of some type, whether it's social media, school newspaper, uh, just your own friend group. What advice do you have, kind of given all that's happening now for, uh, for people, how should they use their own voices to, uh, to make the world a better place? Not haphazardly not haphazardly. That is the best piece of advice I can give anybody. We live in a very reactionary world where, you know, it reminds me of Ricky Bobby from Talladega Nights. If you're not first, you're last, right? That is not applicable to how we should treat media. You don't always have to be first to market. You know, I happened to be first to market when Kobe Bryant passed and it was very challenging for me because you got the real emotional raw side of me. But with that and losing a friend and somebody I looked up to, all of a sudden that I elevated and it was really weird and troubling for me because now every network wanted me to come on their network and deliver my sadness and my grief the same way I delivered it when I first did my first hit on ESPN. And you start to pay attention to how fear mongering and sadness Sales, sales, controversy, sales. You know what sales in my heart, Brian? How do we build bridges between people? We, we are so quick to talk about what makes us all different. Nobody talks about what, what we have in common. 
and how we can stand together, united. We're a very tribal society. Jacob Blake, prime example, the guy that got shot seven times. I don't know all the nuances. I don't know all the difficulties, but I, you know, it's interesting for me coming from New Jersey and I'll be very real with you guys. I grew up having a smorgasbord of friends, Caucasian, Latino, Asian, Jewish, all different kinds of people. And we would have all these conversations about them and their background, about things that were important to them. And when I had that conversation with them, it allowed me to be so much more informed about who they were. And I love them, they were my friends. And after learning more about them, now I'm on your team. You're on my team, you're my, you're my teammate. And all of a sudden, I lost track of what color they were, what creed they were. They were Dresden, they were Brian, they were Peter. They were my boys, they were my brothers. And I want us to, as a society, get to back to this place where things are just easy. You know, we, a lot of black and white these days. Well, I'll switch it and pivot on you guys. There's wrong and right. How are we talking about what's wrong and right? In every situation, I try to come at it from that humanistic angle. One of the best things somebody ever said to me, like, hey, I know you're on job to analyze, but please humanize, humanize. We need more of that. We're all fault. We all faulted. We all have issues. But how are we working through those things collectively together? And how am I not quick to break you down, but create an environment that's open to us learning together? Coach K used to always talk about this. I would get my butt kicked in the game, and he would say to me, don't you put your head down. This is a learning opportunity for you to get better. Go back, watch the tape, assess, work on the things that you think are your weaknesses and get better. And that's the mentality I have for everything. Powerful advice. And, and I think a great place as the, uh, the show goes full circle, right? We started talking about building a brand and, and, you know, having your brand as a broadcaster, yours is generally the analytical voice of reason. And so I think that advice, you know, use your voice, but don't use it haphazardly is, uh, is probably the best uh, you know, exclamation point or, or punctuation, at least that we can put on, uh, on this class. So um, Jay, a huge thanks. Um, you know, the comments are continuing to flood in. Uh, people learned a lot. Um, I guess parting thoughts where, uh, cause you've been moving around a little bit at ESPN. Where can people find you next? Every morning, 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. We start on ESPN news. We move to ESPN two at 7 a.m. Uh, Keyshawn J. Will and Zubin is our morning show. And then also, you know, NBA's biggest games, whenever they're on ESPN, I will be there. Perfect. Well, I think this time of year, we'll, uh, we'll all be there with you. So huge thanks, Jay. Uh, also, you guys can see Jay coming up in about a month, varsitytutors.com. We've got a second class where Jay's going to break down uh, so we can start to see the game like he does as a point guard, as a, a coach, as an analyst, all those kind of things. So um, Jay, huge thanks. On the way out, everybody, we'll put up those instructions for exactly where to, uh, to post and tag those selfies for a chance to win that basketball. And um, Jay, we'll, we'll see you on ESPN. All right, guys, thank you for everything. And remember, if there's anything, do what you do with intent, guys.